on World News Tonight. Pelosi's visit. Angry response from China as they launch their most aggressive live fire drills in over 25 years. ASEAN meeting. First meeting of the 10 member bloc began for the first time since the pandemic and warns of Myanmar's peace plan. Escalating attacks. Rising tensions in Ukraine as armed forces prepare for Russian advancements towards Kursar. And it's a morning fog. Sydney wakes up to a blurry morning as famous landmarks were blanketed by an early morning fog. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, there was a military show of force by China in response to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's historic visit to Taiwan, the self-governed island that China claims it as a part of their territory. Just as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was waving farewell to Taiwan, China responding by firing warning shots, its first live fire exercises off Taiwan since 1996. <laughs> Taiwan says even encroaching into what it considers its territorial waters. China at times sending fighter jets across a critical dividing line between Taiwan and the mainland, according to Taiwan and a senior U.S. official. An aggressive action raising U.S. fears either side could miscalculate. We come in friendship. Pelosi meeting with human rights leaders and Taiwan's democratically elected president Tsai Ing-wen. The speaker saying the world is in a struggle between autocracy and democracy. Our delegation came here to send an unequivocal message. America stands with Taiwan. China, which considers the island its territory, is punishing Taiwan for hosting the speaker by blocking some imports, but not critical semiconductor chips. Taiwan is the world's biggest chip manufacturer. G7 foreign ministers today calling out China's threatening actions, and Pelosi questioning why past trips by male Congress members did not create an outcry from China. I think that that um, they made a big fuss because I'm speaker, I guess. I don't know if that was a reason or an excuse, because they didn't say anything when the men came. <laughs> The Senate passed a resolution ratifying Finland's and Sweden's application to join NATO as the Western Military Alliance seeks to strengthen its resolve against the threat posed by Russia. In a major rebuke to Russia, the U.S. Senate on Wednesday overwhelmingly voted to let Finland and Sweden join NATO, the most significant expansion of the 30-member alliance since the 1990s. On this vote, the yeas are 95, the nays are 1. The Senate easily surpassed the two-thirds majority required in the 100-member chamber to ratify Sweden's and Finland's entry documents. Senators from both parties strongly endorsed their membership into the U.S.-led alliance. Minnesota Democrat Amy Klobuchar spoke before the vote. Russia's unprovoked aggression in Ukraine has changed how we think about the world's security. That's why I strongly support the decision of these two great democracies, Sweden and Finland, to join the most important and defensive alliance in the world, NATO. Missouri Republican Josh Hawley was the lone vote against the motion. Expanding NATO will require more United States forces in Europe. More manpower, more firepower, more resources, more spending. And not just now, but over the long haul. Our foreign policy should be about protecting the United States, our freedoms, our people, our way of life. And expanding NATO, I believe, would not do that. Helsinki and Stockholm applied for membership after Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February. Moscow has repeatedly warned both countries against joining the alliance. Up until now, the two have been able to participate in NATO meetings and have greater access to their intelligence. But they are not protected by Article 5, which states that an attack on one NATO ally is an attack against all. Last month, all 30 NATO allies signed the accession protocol. And once all members ratify the decision, the pair will become the newest members of the nuclear armed alliance, as well as be protected under Article 5 but ratification could take up to a year. However, it has already been approved by a few countries, including Canada, Germany and Italy. 
The 10-member bloc meeting commenced for the first time since the pandemic. Cambodian Prime Minister Hang Sen said that the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, will be forced to reconsider a peace plan agreed with Myanmar if its military rulers execute more prisoners. Behind their smiles and a show of unity, ASEAN ministers are furious after Myanmar's junta ignored their appeals and executed four political prisoners last week. Cambodia, as well as all ASEAN member states, are deeply disappointed and disturbed. If more political prisoners are to be executed, we'll be forced to rethink our role regarding ASEAN's five-point consensus. The five-point peace plan agreed last year includes an immediate end to violence in Myanmar, dialogue among all parties concerned, and humanitarian and economic assistance by ASEAN. The Cambodian leader said the execution of pro-democracy activists changed the situation dramatically. While Malaysia's foreign minister describes the event as a crime against humanity and the mockery of the agreement. ASEAN, which has a tradition of non-interference in internal affairs, has not suspended Myanmar, but has become increasingly frustrated at the junta's lack of progress in implementing the peace plan. While being barred from attending the ASEAN meeting, Myanmar's top generals welcomed a friendly visitor at home. We are uh, in solidarity with the efforts of your prime minister, your government, to normalize and stabilize the situation in Myanmar. Moscow is a major ally of the increasingly isolated junta. It is Myanmar's top supplier of weapons, despite international calls for an arms embargo. Residents in some regions of northeastern Japan woke up to a flooded roads today following torrential rains overnight. Footage showed inundated roads and partially submerged houses in Yamagata Prefecture. A river had burst its banks in Niigata Prefecture, where more than 500 millimeters of rain had fallen in one part in 24 hours, prompting authorities to issue the highest possible level of disaster warnings in some areas. At least three people were reported missing. Roughly 500,000 people were ordered to evacuate Niigata, Ishikawa and Yamagata prefectures, the Fire and Disaster Management Agency said, but there was no immediate reports of fatalities. Though the affected areas are largely rural, there are also homes to a number of factories. Bridges were cut and roads were flooded and service along one portion of Shinkansen superfast train line was suspended. As much of Europe bakes in a third heat wave since June, fears are growing that extreme drought driven by climate change in the continent's breadbasket nations will dent stable crop yields and deepen the cost of living crisis. This resident on the French Riviera has switched to drinking bottled water to keep his taps closed as much as possible. Use of water has been limited to 200 litres per day per household and locals are having to change their habits. We turn the tap off when we use the soap. We don't want to waste any water. The region is experiencing record low rainfalls, 70% below normal levels in some areas. Businesses are also having to cut down water use by half in the case of this restaurant. Tens of thousands are facing increasingly strict water rationing. It may be a little tough when you have children, as they play with water, etc. We're retired, so it's OK. We're not too worried. For watering plants and flowers, we are drawing water from a well. In the capital, Paris, authorities have decided to stop watering public parks during the day. After the third driest spring on record and a prolonged dry spell since then, Rivers and reservoirs are running low nationwide. France's state power company EDF says it may have to reduce output at its nuclear power stations on the Rhone and Garonne rivers, as rising water temperatures are reducing the capacity to cool the plants. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, turning to the latest in the war in Ukraine. Tensions rise in the country's south as more than 20,000 Russian troops are preparing to advance in cities in the region. Ukrainian presidential advisor Oleksiy Arestovich said on Tuesday that some 22,000 Russian troops are heading to Ukraine's Mykolaiv and Krividiyakh 
two major cities that are close to the strategic location of Edison. But according to multiple sources, Arestovich said there are enough Ukrainian troops on the ground there to handle any attack. President Zelensky said Sunday that Russian troops moving to the south will not be beneficial to Moscow and that Ukrainian armed forces are ready to respond. A deputy head of the former Erson Regional Council said on Telegram that the Ukrainian army has recently freed some 50 or so towns. He added that Russian troops suffered great losses during this time. AFP also reported on Monday, quoting Dmitry Butry, the head of the Ukrainian regional administration, that 46 towns have been deoccupied in the Edison region. Butry added that some of the recaptured areas have been 90 percent destroyed and are still under constant fire. Ukraine has been reclaiming the Edison region by striking Russia's supply route and ammunition depot, isolating the occupying troops. Russians are having a tough time countering. Experts say a severe battle in the southern region could take place in the near future if the two sides continue their attacks. The first grain ship to leave Ukraine since the Russian invasion passed through the Bosphorus Strait in its way to Lebanon. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said that the shipment was a fraction of the crop Kyiv must sell to salvage its economy. The first grain ship to leave a Ukrainian port since the Russian invasion cleared another hurdle on Wednesday, passing through the Bosphorus Strait. The hope is that the closely watched ship will be the first of many to help ease a global food crisis. But Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky played it down while speaking virtually to students in Australia. He said the shipment is just a drop in the bucket compared to what's needed. Just recently, thanks to the UN in partnership with Turkey, we had a first ship with the delivery of grain, but it's still nothing. But we hope it's a tendency that will continue. In total, the consequences of this war are horrible, not only for Ukraine, but for the whole world. They will be horrible. The Rizzoni left Odessa on Monday, heading to Lebanon with nearly 30,000 tons of corn. Welcome to Turkey. By Wednesday, the ship had cleared a key inspection by Russian, Ukrainian, Turkish and UN personnel. Its departure comes after Turkey and the UN brokered a grain and fertilizer export deal between Moscow and Kyiv last month. Russia had blockaded the ports after launching what it calls a special military operation in February. The agreement marked a rare diplomatic breakthrough in a drawn-out war of attrition. Ukraine's infrastructure minister says 17 more ships are loaded and waiting for the green light to set sail. As for the Rizzoni, Ukraine's ambassador to Lebanon says it's expected to arrive in Tripoli within five days. The U.S. announced new financial sanctions over the Ukrainian war targeting the woman rumored to be Vladimir Putin's girlfriend, Alina Kabaeva. New U.S. sanctions targeting some of Vladimir Putin's closest allies, including Alina Kabaeva, the woman rumored to be the Russian president's girlfriend. It's the latest move by the Biden administration to ramp up pressure on Putin over his war in Ukraine and a step the U.S. had previously avoided out of concern it would escalate tensions with Moscow, U.S. officials told The Wall Street Journal. In April, the newspaper also reported that U.S. and European officials believe Kabaeva is the mother of at least one of Putin's children. The U.S. Treasury Department now says she has, quote, a close relationship with Putin, without specifying whether it's romantic. I think the message is, if you don't want to be sanctioned, you need to distance yourself from Putin. You need to not support Russia's invasion of Ukraine. A former Olympic gold medalist in rhythmic gymnastics, Kabaeva is known as Russia's most flexible woman and once served in the state Duma, Russia's parliament. She's now the chairwoman for the National Media Group, a state-aligned conglomerate that owns a variety of Russian news media, TV, and film companies. The new sanctions freeze any assets Kabaeva has in the U.S. and bar U.S. persons from doing business with her. It's unclear what, if any, assets Kabaeva has in the U.S., but it's part of a strategy of increasingly isolating those connected to Putin and Russia's war in Ukraine. The sanctions bring the U.S. into step with the U.K. and the European Union, 
both of which have already imposed sanctions and restrictions on Kabaeva in recent months. In April, the former gymnast made a rare public appearance at a gymnastics exhibition in Moscow. She spoke at the event, called the Alina Festival, in her honor. She made the comment standing in front of Z's a symbol that's become a mark of support for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We reached out to the national media group she chairs for comment, but didn't receive a response. In 2008, a Russian tabloid reported that Putin had divorced his wife at the time and planned to marry Kabaeva. Putin vigorously denied the story, and hours later, publishers shut the paper down. Moderna maintained its full-year COVID vaccine sales forecast for $21 billion as cancelled orders from the COVAX program offset gains from new boost doses orders. Shares of Moderna climbed as high as almost 17 percent in morning trading after the vaccine maker announced a $3 billion share buyback plan when it reported earnings on Wednesday. Moderna also said it was keeping its full-year sales forecast for COVID-19 vaccines unchanged as canceled orders from low- and middle-income nations offset gains from new booster orders. Moderna has begun producing a redesigned booster that targets both the original coronavirus as well as Omicron's subvariants. It signed a $1.7 billion deal with the U.S. government last week for 66 million doses to be available this fall and winter if they're cleared by health regulators. Despite that big contract, Moderna kept its sales outlook unchanged as doses earmarked for the COVAX vaccine sharing program remain unallocated due to low demand. CEO Stefan Bonsell said in an interview outright that the unchanged sales forecast was because of COVAX, adding that, quote, COVAX does not want the doses that they have ordered. Moderna and rival Pfizer have been banking on recurring booster doses, including an Omicron-tailored version, to garner more vaccine contracts. Moderna reported $4.5 billion in COVID vaccine sales in the second quarter, but took a near half a billion dollar charge related to vaccines that have expired. Welcome back to World News Tonight. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A volcano in Iceland has erupted near the capital. According to Iceland's meteorological agency, the volcano erupted after days of earthquakes. It is spewing magma over a lava field created by last year's eruption. Code Red has been declared to prevent airplanes from flying near the volcano. Influential Shiite cleric Maktada al sadr told followers to continue its sitting inside Iraq's government zone and called for the dissolution of parliament and early elections, signaling a deepening power struggle with his rivals. German carmaker BMW warned of a highly volatile second half and challenges from inflation to gas shortages, fears weighing on demand with higher pricing only partially offsetting lower output. A top coach of U.S. women's pro basketball, Becky Hammond, who once represented Russia at the Olympics, has made a plea to Russian President Vladimir Putin to do the right thing and quickly release American star player Brittany Griner. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi arrived in South Korea from Taiwan. Pelosi met with South Korean National Assembly Speaker Kim Jong-pil. They also reportedly agreed on the importance of boosting ties on security, economy and government. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, let's take a look how Sydney's famous landmarks were blanketed in a thick morning fog. Stay safe and have a good night.